Man, I had a lot of technology issues here recently. We're going to bathe this place in some scripture, amen? <laughs> um, we're going to read in Psalms 145, if you'd like to join me there, um, entering into this time of worship this morning. It says in verse 1, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation will commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your, all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Let's worship our Lord, for he is holy, and he is worthy to be praised this morning.
You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken, and great are you, Lord, it's your
Father, you're so beautiful. You're so holy. And we just thank you so much for this time together to lift up your name, to praise you. You're so faithful. You're so good. Help us to be still. And just to rest in your presence, Lord. There's nothing like being with you. And as we open your word and hear what you have laid in David's heart to share this morning, Lord. Holy Spirit, come convict us where we need to be convicted. And may we be faithful to follow and and pursue you, Jesus. You're all we want, Lord. Would you keep us here until we're one? We want to know your heart. We love you, Father. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. Well, great is the Lord. Amen. I said, great is the Lord. Amen. All right. Well, thank you for the great worship, Josie, and you guys behind us. It was uh, good to sit on the front row for a change. A lot of times I'm uh, figuring out this or that during this service because I come at 830. By the way, if no one tells you, youth, young ladies and young men, we missed you last week. That whole section was completely void and empty, and it looks great. Thank you for using your lives this week. For those of you who had a chance to go, uh, just to kind of get out of comfort zones. I hear we did a little of the Acts 2020, door-to-door, household-to-household kind of canvassing. Uh, that was a little bit spooky, wasn't it, Carl, a little bit? No? Good? Horrible. Oh, all right. Carl, now when I do that, I kind of expect a good church answer back. I don't want to hear horrible, okay? I mean, let's fake everybody out here and act like we're all good here today. Normal. Oh, I thought it was horrible. I go, oh, my gosh. 
Okay. Now, what was that, Greg? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, we're going to move on on that part. <laughs> And again, if you'd be praying for our college students, they're going to have a really long day and getting in real late. And then for Rusty and Chris, again, I think, uh, you know, Nicaragua's gone through some things. I don't even uh, profess to know all that's going on in that country, but I know many of you have gone. Many of you, uh, just the word Nicaragua evokes an emotion for you, and it's uh, a love. And so we're hopeful that while they're there, they can see exactly what is going on and what that partnership might look. But Here's the thing we know, God transcends all those space and time kind of issues, and he's just as much in Leon, Nicaragua, and right as much in Thomas Borges and that church as he is right here, amen. And so we're glad that you've chosen to be here today, and again, as I often say, and, and I get scolded at times, uh, you got what you got with me today, and so again, I would covet your prayers, it's... Uh, um, Luann, I, I don't know how much Rusty does tell or doesn't tell, but uh, Karen's probably uh, gone crazy the last couple of days just trying to watch me get prepared for here. And she said, how much are you going to keep studying? And, all, and then she said, how long are you going to preach? That was a bigger question. It takes a whole lot of study to say a whole lot less. And so I'm not sure I can get that all packaged in there together. But again, it's a privilege to get to be here and, uh, and get to represent Christ first and Trinity Baptist and even for Brother Rusty as he is away from us there. So um, I'm a guy that always likes to go a little bit and backtrack some just to keep everybody kind of on the same pace and walking with us. And so some of you may not have been here because I, I know some weren't because last week uh, there were a whole lot more emptier pews than we have today. And I know we're on the backside of spring break, but I want to give you a little backdrop. So last Sunday... Uh, Rusty began a new sermon series. Everybody hearing me okay? I can talk louder. Everybody's good? Groovy? Thumbs up? Because I can't see heads bobbing. All right, all right, we're good. I got way back on the back. We're good. But he began a new sermon series called Who's Your One? And uh, it's, a, it's a sort of a, a little bit of a movement from the North American Mission Board that we begin to think about who's our one. And, and it's about evangelism. Just to be real honest with you, it's the E word. It's about evangelism, and that's okay. And I'm going to hopefully today, through God's help and His direction and Him speaking through me, to give you some things to think about when it comes to this area of evangelism. But we're four weeks from Easter. So again, if you haven't heard it, let me just make sure you do. So I'll give a little announcement. Four weeks from Easter, April the 21st, we'll be right back here. We're not going to the college we will be here in our home church for Easter services. We will do two. We will do the 8.30 service and the 10.45. In the middle of that, 10 o'clock, we'll do a big family or really kids Easter egg hunt. So if you want to bring your families and come be a part of that time, it'll be good stuff. That'll be right between the two. 8.30, 10 o'clock egg hunt, 10.45 second service. So I want to do that. But here's the thing I would tell you that Easter has and continues to be one of the most attended services and Sundays out of the entire year. It just is. It just happens that way. Um, you know, mamas get all the kids, come on home, we're going to, you know, come to church with us, or, or grandmas do that, or in some cases we do that really out of just out of honor. Uh, in my family, my mom and dad are both gone, but uh, my mom and dad brought me to this very church umpteen years ago, and uh, so I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here no matter what, but I'd want you to be here, and I'd want you to bring people with you. But it has been and will continue to be that most attended church service in the entire year. In fact, just to be really honest with you, most folks are willing to accept an invitation from you if you'll just invite them for Easter. They may not come some other Sunday, but they'll come on Easter. And so they're very willing to, to really accept the invitation and, and to do that. But they're willingness to accept hinges on our inviting them okay so i know we've done that who's your one and that's more evangelism but let's just kind of do it in a minute i'm going to tell you a little backdrop to what rusty gave us last week but it can be just a simple invitation like it was just come and see i'll let you even i won't even grade you hard on it. just come and see have that kind of mentality as you go through the next four weeks is that a deal 
you'll be thinking about that, inviting someone to be a part of Easter service. So last week, Rusty had us turn into John chapter 1. Don't have to turn there. We're not going there. So I'm just giving the backdrop, okay? But he had us to go to John chapter 1. It's that passage where Jesus was calling his first disciples, his followers, and Rusty gave us four Ps. So I could probably poll all of you and you'd know exactly what the four Ps were. But he gave us four Ps. He gave us plan, progression, priority, and prayer. Those were the four Ps he gave us in that particular passage. Everybody remember that a little bit, parts of it? That's what he gave us. And so the plan was really not very complicated. In fact, it was real simple, just come and see. So I know when we think about evangelism, a lot of times we get real kind of juiced up. It spooks our mule. We don't know what we're supposed to say, what all that kind of stuff. Again, in this service, I'm old school. I'm older than my 58 years of living, so I'm an old soul. So spook your mule is just kind of one of those deals that gets you, your fear up, okay? You with me, kids? Got it? Okay, amen. So you got it, amen. Amen, there you go. So, so these four Ps, but the plan wasn't complicated. It was a simple invite, come and see. The progression and the priority were modeled by two sets of brothers. Andrew and Peter and Philip and Nathaniel. They modeled it right quick. In fact, they wanted their family to know it first. That's what it says. You can check me out later. You don't have to do it now. They went first. That's what happened. And so this progression and this priority happened there. And these two brothers did it, and they went, and they wanted to say, come and see. And then we concluded with prayer time. And uh, because we knew we were going to go, who's your one? Some of us had a little bit of an idea of who our one would be. And so last week when you came through, the bulletin had this stuck in here, and this was perforated where you could tear that off. And some came last Sunday and put their who's your one on the altar, or what we call our altar here, these steps. Now, if you didn't get one of those, there are several out in the uh, Connection Center. I encourage you to get one and do that. So if people had them, they put them on there. If they didn't, we prayed. We just knelt down, and many of you came forward, and we just knelt down and we just prayed, God, reveal that one that you want me to share Christ with. Just reveal that one. Tell us who it is. And if we didn't do that, I'm confident we knelt down and we bent our knees because many came and we just sought the Lord's guidance in our lives that we might be more mindful of this thing called evangelism. And so... That's kind of what we want to continue with. Who's your one? Asking God to reveal that to us if he could and do those things. But I'm going to kind of take a different twist today. It's still going to be about who's your one. I got little cards here, so don't get all freaked out about all that stuff there. That's just my kind of my crutch. If I get off, I can have them. Uh, Rusty and I talked beforehand. I don't know I said that word. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that word in here or not, but I did. So there again, I can clean up my resume, Gary. But... But he and I talked about this series coming up. And we even talked about, because when Rusty's out of the pulpit, we have a lot of races to run and a lot of horses that want to run the races. And who's going to be the voice box? And so we were thinking and talking, and even Zach was involved in the conversation. And we talked about prayer, and we'll be talking more about prayer. We've been talking about identifying our one. I think all those are important things, by the way. I absolutely believe we ought to have laser focus and ask God to do that, to show us that one. I believe certainly we ought to be praying, but we began to talk about another subject that came along the deal, and that's kind of how I fell a little bit heir to this message, I think, from that. It's a little old-fashioned terminology, but perhaps you'll allow me to use it today, and it's simply this, being burdened for lost souls. Being burdened for lost souls. Uh, sometimes we don't say that word often. There's a lot of words we've kind of gotten away from, but just absolutely being burdened for lost souls. See, uh, I think we live, and I could be wrong about this, but we live in this culture and this world where we're presented with close-ups daily of all the inequities, the injustices that are going on in the world. They're brought right into our front rooms and our TV sets. They're brought by many of you. Mine's on the front pew even by our mobile devices. We do it through social media. But all of these injustices, these inequities are out in the world today, guys, are brought front and center to us. And there are big needs. There's things like poverty and hunger and political upheaval. There's financial things. There's all kinds of implorable living conditions. We 
We have people going to those. We send teams there for those things, and I think they're good. Don't misunderstand me, and don't mishear me on this or tune me out on all this. I think they are. But if we're not careful, I believe we can often overlook, unintentionally step over the greatest need a person has in their life. We can get them well fed. We can get them well dressed. But well fed and well dressed to hell is about all we're going to get done if they have not had a spiritual experience of accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And sometimes we can often overlook. I don't believe it's intentional. And we live in a generation where a lot of the younger ones, it's, it's all about those injustices and what can I do. And, and I don't make fun of this. I don't make light of this. There are many of those. In fact, I couldn't get to do what I do at this church because we do it old-fashioned terminology as a benevolent ministry. We call it community assistance now, but the opportunity to meet physical needs. But help us. May it be for all of us that when we see the need, we look beyond the need. If I were a counselor, I guess, Calvin, it's that presenting problem and what's the real problem. See what I'm saying? Those things happen along the way. And so I believe that Jesus, absolutely, so this is not an either or. So if you're thinking, oh, my gosh, he's going to get on. I'm, it's not an either or. It's a both. Jesus, I believe, if you looked at his life in ministry, could probably be put in thirds. Now, I don't know exactly if I can prove that theologically or not, but that's kind of what I think. I say that because he's steep and deep in education along with Rusty and all those things. I mean that in a, in a complimentary way. I really do. But he went around healing, teaching, and preaching. A third met physical needs, I think. We're going to look at a passage where they were following him everywhere. He was touching the deaf, the blind, the lame, all those things. But two-thirds of it was teaching and preaching what your Bible says, the kingdom or the gospel of God. And so that's important stuff that we think about those things as we go along because this is important kinds of things as we do that. So I just kind of want to open up our conversation kind of with that thought. If you're okay with that, if we can look at that. And so for me, because I've had a week or so to prepare, is I've asked God, I think a, a pretty tough prayer. Uh, I've asked God, would you, would you break my heart with what breaks your heart? God, would you break my heart for what really breaks your heart? And what I'm talking about, guys, and you already know where I'm at, you're tracking, is to give me, if it needs to be renewed, if it hadn't been there, but a burden for lost souls. And I may be way off, and all this is just for David Gray. And you'll just kind of get to hear me having a little conversation with God today. But I thought I heard him through, not an audible voice, but as I prepared, that maybe some others are just like that. They see the need, and they want to respond to the need. But do we ever stop short of being burdened for souls, lost souls? And so I want us to renew the burden. I want it to be a genuine concern. I want it to be uh, whatever you want to call that, an evangelistic zeal, a compassion, whatever you want to. That's what I want us to think about today. And I'm going to do my best to talk quicker than I did at the other service. I preached for an hour and a half at 8.30, and we didn't get out till 10. I'm just kidding, by the way. That's why I can't figure out why he still lets me preach, because he knows I'm never going to probably do it in a short amount of time. Here we go. If you have your Bibles or your mobile devices or whatever you choose to use, go to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew in the ninth chapter. And for you Bible readers, you probably already know where I'm headed. It's a pretty familiar passage, but that's where we want to go. So we want to do that. Matthew chapter 9, let's start with verse 35. Matthew 9, 35. Matthew 9, 35. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in the synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless 
like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, most of your Bibles ought to change from black ink on white paper to red ink on white paper. And the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into this or his harvest field. That is the word of the Lord. Father, we ask right now that you open our hearts and our minds, and I pray, Holy Spirit, that you can touch me, that I might be able to speak in the very power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit, rightly dividing your word of truth, and that it might, your word, not David's voice, not anybody else, no guilt, no shame, just you, your word, would sear our hearts and open our minds to rightly divide it and apply it to our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In this passage, Jesus is, uh, is uh, looking at this multitude, uh, or crowd, if you will, depending on, on what translation that you look at. But he, he sees the crowds, the King James would say multitudes, he sees out there. He sees that, uh, which tells me again, he saw, it's a chase of rabbit for a moment, but what's your qualifier when you're in this deal of sharing Christ? What's your qualifier when you see I mean, do you, do you see it, and do you put it through your lens, or do you look through his lens? So what's your qualifier? Just a freebie. But he saw these folks. He saw them. He saw that they were helpless and hopeless and hurting. And then it says that Jesus was what? Moved. That is, what he saw evoked an emotion. He saw what he saw, and it, it, it caused something when it happened. And he began with compassion. And I think there are three things that we can take from this short little passage that I believe that caused Jesus to be moved with compassion. And my prayer is that the same thing that moved Jesus will turn around and move me and it will move you as we move forward with this who's your one. And so that's what we're going to try to look at a little bit. And it is, I believe, a burden for lost souls. But the first thing I think I see there is Jesus absolutely saw their despair without a shepherd. He says in that particular verse, he says, when he saw the crowd, he had compassion because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So I believe he saw that despair. Despair is just not having hope. If you looked it up in a dictionary, it would be defined as not having hope. And it reminds me, I know I'm old school, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. I have hope. Most of you in here have hope. You're anchored. You're set up. But did you know, if you'll look, you'll find a person today that's in despair, that does not have hope. And so they were scattered. Uh, they're scattered, King James says. So I like that word because it says they were scattered. And in the, in the NIV, it says they were rasped, but they were scattered. I don't know about you, but, but when I see things are scattered... Sometimes it's trying to group them back together. In a backdrop, if I could chase just a little bit of a vein, you think about these people. They've been following Jesus, seeing all the miracles he's been doing. Listen to this new teaching he's got going on, Tommy, that says, you know, my burden's light. It's not heavy. And they don't have hope because what the religious leaders do? Gave them a whole bunch of more rules to follow, 613 to be exact, to follow, to do. And so this is a sidebar to the whole thing. But these are people, they came, they're scattered, they're harassed, and they're there. And it just tells me and shows me that these are folks that they're kind of just on the outside. You ever notice that? People just get on the outside. Maybe something happens in life and they just don't fight, quite fit in anymore. They're on the outside. You've seen them. You walk up and you just want to kind of include them. There's no protection. Shepherd's hard to protect when his flock's all scattered and so there's no protection there's no guidance there and and so again he he looks at that no comfort or rest they wander off of sheep you know they're they're just wander off they're they're prone to the attacks and all the things that happen they're, they're just out of there uh we we've gone through this this book of ephesians if you have your bibles turn over there let me just kind of let it be its own little uh uh, a long little commentary for you there if you want to kind of look at this. This is Jesus saw their despair. They were kind of that helpless, hopeless, harassed kind of people. Second uh, chapter 2 of Ephesians. If you can get over there, uh, look for, for verse 12. 
Again, I know I'm picking a verse, and we, we, we can tend to contextually lose some things, but Paul, again, is talking all about that. He's been reaching out to Gentiles and Jews, and he's been teaching and preaching and all those, and he's talking about circumcision and uncircumcision and a lot of all those traditions and things that have to happen to be included. But here's what happens. Ephesians 2.12, remember that at the time you were separate from, separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship and foreigners to the covenant of promise, what's that word? Without hope and without God in the world. Now, I don't know when you see people, if you see people without hope and without God in their lives, but they're out there. You look for them. And so we see these things begin to happen, and there's that despair that happens. The second thing that happens is Jesus saw their depravity, the depravity of sin. And so again, Jesus sees beyond the physical. If I were a counselor, I'd say with that listening third ear, that presenting the problem, what's behind the problem, let's get to that. It's kind of symptoms, if you will, if I were looking at it. King James would say they fainted, but he's not talking about physically. He's talking about, again, spiritually. He's looking with the spiritual eye there, and NIV calls it helpless, but these are destitute, weary, beleaguered, burdened, loaded-down people who are trying to get through life. That's what they really are. Again, because they've been all these... Religious people have been putting all these burdens on them. All these things have happened on that. And again, that's for a whole other study. But again, but Jesus saw beyond all that. He was moved with compassion because he saw this burdensome load they were under and what they were doing. So if you had your finger still over in Ephesians, just turn one page probably. Let's go to the same chapter, Ephesians 2. But let me just remind you, let's let this Bible be its own kind of proof for you. Ephesians chapter 2 Verse 1, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you follow the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. So this is a condition that Jesus, when he saw and he was moved, he saw all those things. Uh, and, and so here's the deal. I jotted a little note. I don't know that I can make it absolutely fit like a piece in a puzzle, but I believe God let me say it, and I'm going to, is again, we have to guard ourselves, I believe, in this, because what happens is, we just see the symptoms and we fail to see the depravity of sin and how bad sin is, and we just scoot past that if we're not careful. We just go past that. Somehow or another, we, we've lost, we've absolutely lost the depth from which we ourselves were. We were messed up, depraved, messed up people in need of a Savior. All of us, who know Jesus and confess Him as Lord and Savior, this is who you were. That's who I was. And when you see somebody out there, is that what you're seeing? Or do you say, I started just for, just for kicks. I started to take a cardboard sign, get me a big king-size Sharpie, and put on the front, homeless, will work for food, need diapers, uh, uh, whatever I would have put on the note I could have put on there. And I thought about having that, just having it up there, and then on the other side of it, I was going to flip it around and say, tell me about Jesus. Tell me about Jesus. Because if we're not careful, we see the need of what it is. And we've been in this world so long that we've become so hardened and so callous that all we see is somebody that blew their money at the casino or buying a pack of cigarettes or doing that. And I'm not, I'm not excusing that behavior, guys. I'm just saying they present something that's a whole lot deeper, a whole lot deeper than getting their utilities paid or a bag of groceries or a prescription or whatever. They're, 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 they're in a despair, the depravity of their sin, and they're looking for somebody to show them the way out. The other day I was filling up the van over at Campus Corner and uh, 
full, fueling it up, just kind of minding my business. And a guy rode up on a motorcycle, and he stopped over there, and he said, uh, he said, uh, I said, can I help you? And he said, well, I, I'm trying to get somewhere. And I said, you tell me where you're trying to get, and I can get you there. Tell me, tell me where you're wanting to go. He said, well, I'm, I'm trying to get to Ardmore. And I said, okay. Where, and he started telling me where he'd come from, and it was a crazy route he had taken. But, but there are people just like the guy on the motorcycle or motorcycle for you guys. <laughs> it's the same thing. There are two wheels on them. Got a seat. It's a real cool deal. Got handlebars. But there are people all in your path. Some of them will walk right up and say, hey, can you tell me how to get somewhere? It's your invite. We do a thing called the big feed. We can give them a bag of groceries. They'll feed them for a few days. They'll get hungry again. Can I tell you about the bread of life? We can give them a bottle of water. They'll get thirsty again. Can I tell you about living water? And pay your electric bill. It'll be due for another 30 days. It'll be due again. Can I tell you about how you can have power to live? It doesn't take a rocket science because I'm one of them, and I can have conversations all day long like that. You can just take a look at that. But I'm going to tell you, you got to look beyond that symptom sometimes and see that. And I just believe that we have lost, I think we've lost some of that, that scene of the depravity of sin when you look out at the world today. I wish I had the time. Matthew 24, 7 says, As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. You can go to Genesis 6, 5, and it'll tell you a little bit about what the days of Noah were like. Just by the way, the little cliff note to that, it went good. It wasn't good. Every inclination, every imagination of the thoughts was continually evil. So again, that's just what we're dealing with. And so this depravity that we look at in doing those things. Jeremiah 17, 9 talks about the heart. You know, it talks about how deceitful above all things, and it's desperately wicked. Do you see those people like that? Well, I wouldn't want to get involved with those people. Well, <laughs> just check it. I'm just saying, ask your questions. I mean, I could go back and chase all kinds of scriptures. I don't have time to. But Jesus himself said, it's not the well, the healthy that need a doctor. It's the sick that need the doctor. Those are the very ones who need it. That's the ones who need what we have he saw their despair. He saw their depravity. He saw what I believe is the destiny. And I don't know if we ever get that. But just a little news flash. If you know someone today by name, and you don't know that they know Jesus as their Savior and Lord, and before our service ends, you get word they die, do you know that they're going to hell? That's the destiny for a lost soul without Jesus. I'm not here to make you mad. I'm not here to make you invoke any emotion, but that's what's going to happen. I wish I could chase Ezekiel out where he talked about being a watchman and accountability when we don't share. But I'm telling you, that's the destination for every lost person. So youth, when you went and you knocked on the door and you invited them to a church service, if they didn't come to know Christ on your little trip, who's to say they won't in that progression find Jesus, and you know what you did? You, through your obedience and knocking on the door, and as scared as you may have been, or as normal as it was, or whatever words we want to use, you put forth an invite to come know Jesus. You literally could have changed their forevers. And their home now is in heaven and not in hell. And that's what we got to get into our minds, folks, is this situation, this destination. And, and again, if we're not careful... Oh, they're just bad people and, you know, all that, and there'll be another. But, folk, if they die today without Jesus, their destination's hell. And that may be hard, but that's just the reality of it. And, again, in Luke 16, I'm not going to go there. Rusty may want to use it, but it's that story and the account of Lazarus and the rich young, rich young man or the rich man, and they both died. And you remember Lazarus went, I'm giving a paraphrase, so if he wants to go the message, he can there. But the paraphrase, he was by the angels of Abraham and then the rich man. And he said, could you just have him dip his finger in the water and, and do it? Because i got brothers back there. I'd like for him to go and tell. It, it's a pretty bad place. The Bible says it's, uh, it's very much uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth. I, we, we can't doll it up with all the... TVs and stuff we have, this is a bad, bad place. It's, it's a fiery furnace. 
it's just it's it's bad it's eternal separation so let me turn the corner here for you because you're about probably getting bored to listen to me so so here's the deal jesus moves from seeing in those first verses now he's going to give us something that he said so he's going from seeing to saying so if you're still with me in in, in matthew chapter 9 I, I want us to to take a peek there and we're going to kind of try to wrap this up a little bit everybody still doing okay are y'all hear me? I just recognize if I put that microphone up closer, it even sounds louder. Amen? Everybody's good? Still with me? So he went from seeing to saying, and Jesus places this. Let's just look at it. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, plenteous, whatever you want to see in whatever version, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. He goes from seeing to saying. Jesus places the responsibility on us as disciples, as followers, uh, everyone who professes Christ. And so a couple of things. For me, it's easy. I have to have application. That's just how I teach. That's how I preach is application. I think we have to begin by just seeing it, visualizing, if I can, visualizing this, this harvest, recognizing that there's people waiting. They're, they're waiting. In fact, John 4 says that it's white into harvest or ripe into harvest. There's actually a harvest ready to be plucked. Now, we've got all the low-bearing fruit, and then we may have to stretch a little bit to get some, but I'm telling you, they're, they're ready to be picked. They're ready for it. They're ready for you to ask them. They're waiting for us to invite them to Easter. So they're waiting for those things. There are those. Now, there's some that aren't. I'm not going to say, but we will never reap until we enter the field. We have to enter the field, and I can't excuse any of you. We all have to. He says we're to go into the world and preach the good news to all creation. We have that. We have to visualize those things. We have to agonize. How long has it been since you just agonized over a lost soul? Absolutely just got burdened down with it and agonized. And he says, pray you therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest. Uh, there's a call to be broken and burdened for lost is your heart broken over lost souls? Who's your one? Who's your one? I'm telling you today, folk, it ought to be, and it probably won't be, and I wish it would, but, but unless you choose to respond, we ought to be gathering on steps around this place, mounting an attack right now that would keep people from going to hell and praying for opportunities. God, give them more life that I might be able to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. Keep them here where I can do those kind of things. And I'm telling you, praying and seeking the lost. We have to evangelize. Uh, it's not enough to see it and pray about it and all those things. We're going to have to get out in the, in the game. We're going to have to do it. That's what Acts 1-8 says. You'll be my witnesses. Again, that's, that's why... Uh, we're going to have to be like, like Andrew who found Peter and Philip who found Nathaniel. We, we're going to have to be those ones. We're going to have to get out there. That's why Jesus said, come follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. You want to talk about a sidebar just a moment on progression? Most of the first followers were people that got, got loose in their little, little parts of their growing up to be little Jewish boys, to be kind of those, those rabbis, and they got cut because they weren't smart enough. And they were, went back to their family vocation of fishing. And did you know from a group of fishermen, the best I got it figured out, Kyle, because your daddy knew this to fish a lot on the lake, didn't you? If you can take a bunch of fishermen with dirt under their fingernails and mud between their toes and change the world around, you want to talk about progression? I'm telling you, you don't have a clue what you can be in God's, in God's army. I'm telling you, it can change the world. I get to stand what I get to stand because people had a plan and a priority and a progression, and I ain't much. I can identify so much with that song that we sang a little bit ago. Man, I could identify with that. I still battle some days thinking I'm good enough. I, nobody wants me. But man, what a progression. Start with a mom and dad who dragged me to church. Start with lots of folks that were in that first service and some in this second that just kept on loving on me. Most of you are here today. Most of you are here today because somebody had a burden for a lost soul. And they went and they took and put in the plan, into effect the plan and the prayer and the priority and all that. We're there because of those things. And then we're asking you basically to prioritize. We're asking you, if you would, 
for just the next four weeks or so to prioritize personal evangelism and join us intentionally pursuing who's your one. I'm telling you, it'll be there. But just, just again, in, in, in breaking it down in simple terms, it's just one of those things. Uh, we can't do everything, but we can do something. If each one will reach one, it's probably some line out of some song, but it ought to be. But each one can reach one. And I'm going to tell you, I believe that we need to have, and I believe we are, and I believe maybe you're getting it. We ought to be burdened for lost souls. I'm telling you, we ought to see that despair, that depravity, that destination. And then we need to be like Jesus. We need to be moved with compassion. And we ought to see the needs out there. And we don't need to use our qualifiers. The best I got it figured out. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm telling you, it's a, it's a big deal. You may be here today, and you've sat in a pew for a long time. You may have your name on a roll. You may have been dunked under the water in baptism. But if you died today, would you go to heaven? If you literally died today, would you know what you know what you know you're going to heaven? I'm, I'm not going to use old school and try to scare you, but it's worth finding out today, catching one of us and just having a conversation. Oh, I've been a good boy. I've been a good girl. I've done this. I've done that. You know, I talked to a lot of people that do a lot of good things. I said, that might keep you out of jail, but it won't keep you out of hell. I mean, you, you just absolutely have got to have Jesus. He's your ticket. And so I don't know, or maybe you want to come and maybe you want to kind of do a little warfare today. Maybe you want to pray for somebody that's on your card, or maybe you don't even have a card. Maybe you need to get a card, <laughs> uh, but you need to pray for who's your one. You just want to do something. You want to engage the enemy today, being praying that we'd be burdened for lost souls. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for giving us a story and a picture in your Bible that shows us what it's like to see lost souls. I thank you for your story that tells us that you were moved with compassion. I thank you, God, that you are able to use folks like me and others in this service who've turned their hearts and their lives to you and have prayed that prayer and asked your son Jesus to forgive them of their sins and to, and to be their Lord. And I got a suspicion, God, that that's the plan you still have in place for us is that we're, we're supposed to be the ones that go. And uh, I don't want anybody to walk out thinking I've tried to chew them out today. I've just tried to articulate what I believe you've called me to say today. And it's time for us to be burdened over lost souls. Someone here today that has not ever experienced the free pardon of sin through the blood of Jesus, I pray they'd catch one of us down here and have a conversation or maybe who they came with. There's those today that need to just pray for that one. I pray they'll come forward. That's about all I can say and all I can pray. I pray you'll move in us and do something in us that's a little bit different than the norm. Help us to be who you'd call us to be. We pray and ask it all in Jesus' name. Would you stand with us as we sing? This is my worship, this is my offering, in every moment I withhold nothing, I'm learned to I'm free, I have to believe it, if you say it's wrong then I'll say no, if you say release I'm letting go. If you're in it with me, I'll begin 